two years ago today, I did my first Generation 2 playthrough on the channel, and it was a solo Butterfree run in Pokemon Gold. A year after that, I did my first Generation 3 video with Butterfree in Pokemon Emerald, and now today I am ready to once again introduce a new game to the channel. It's time to start playing some Fire Red and Leaf Green. In this video, I'm going to beat Pokemon Fire Red with a Butterfree, actually the Butterfree line. I am going to start as a Caterpie today. If you've been watching my live streams, you will have heard me talk about how I am not really liking the approach of evolving throughout playthroughs. So I do want to spend some time talking about that today. But first, let's go over Butterfree. For base stats, it has 60 HP, 45 attack, 50 defense, 70 speed, and 80 special attack and 80 special defense. So it's mostly a fast special attacker. For an ability, it's going to have compound eyes and normally I'll talk about hidden power at the beginning of these videos but as a breath of fresh air you can actually only get the hidden power TM if you have the ability pick up and I ban using pick up on the Pokemon I'm using for HMs. So in these videos I'm not going to be able to use this incredibly flexible move to solve my problems. I'm just going to have to deal with the move pool that the Pokemon already has access to. And finally in generation 3 Butterfree gets a pretty decent move pool. Obviously it starts off with Confusion, then it gets Sleep Powder through level up, as well as Gust, the same type of attack bonus move, and then Psybeam. But it also now gets Silver Wind, which is basically a bug type ancient power, so I can see that being very useful. Through TMs and HMs, it gets access to Giga Drain, Solar Beam, Return, Psychic, Shadow Ball, Aerial Ace, Secret Power, and rest. Now there are also move tutors in this game and one of them teaches the move Dream Eater, which yes, Butterfree can learn and it's going to become uh, important later on. I will explain why. So many people have mentioned to me in my prior videos, especially in Generation 1, why not teach Butterfree Dream Eater? Well, uh, in Generation 1, Butterfree cannot learn Dream Eater, so that's why. I've tried really hard to include all the information you would need when watching this video on the screen, so like the move pool, the stats, that sort of thing. So uh, please check those things out before you uh, type in, why not teach Butterfree X move? It's probably because it doesn't learn it. Now you will notice here that I'm going to be using a modest Butterfree and I actually got really lucky today and I just got a modest Caterpie. I didn't even need to change that. Normally what happens in these generation three videos is I get my starter. I have to do the first battle with some other nature and then I put it into PK hex, edit the save data and then reload the ROM. Anyways, Modest is perfect for Butterfree because it raises special attack and lowers attack, and I'm really not going to be using my attack stat very much, which is unfortunate because the bug and the flying types are both physical types in Generation 3, but at least my psychic type moves are going to be hitting harder. So now as I level up my Caterpie and evolve it into a Metapod and then later on a Butterfree, let's talk about why I said I don't like evolution in these playthroughs. And the reason is quite simple. I got a lot of feedback in Generation 1 that I should let my Pokemon evolve throughout the playthrough, but I was already deep into that series, so I didn't want to change my rules and have it mess with my rankings. So I decided in Generation 2, when I switched up my rules last January, to start evolving Pokemon in their playthroughs. And here's what I've found, because I've had the ability this year to compare and contrast the two approaches. In Generation 1, Whenever I play with a fully evolved Pokemon, it feels like I'm racing through the game trying to get the best possible time and outdo all of the other fast Pokemon. The uh, Pokemon that go fast in the game, not Pokemon like Electrode or Voltorb. <laughs> And then when I play with a first stage Pokemon, it feels completely different. I'm trying to just barely scrape through the game. It's really challenging. Most of the foes are extreme threats. And so what ends up happening is each evolutionary line has sort of a different style of playthrough. For instance, if I'm doing a coughing playthrough, it's going to feel very challenging and tough. Whereas when I do a wheezing challenge, I'm going to be seeing how fast it can go. So if I sit down at the beginning of the week and I'm like, I want to do a tough challenge, I can choose a first stage Pokemon and make a video on it. And if I sit down at the beginning of the week and I'm like, I want to do something where I race Pokemon, then I can choose two fully evolved Pokemon and make a versus video. Now, what I discovered in generation two is that when I do evolutions in the video, it sort of levels out the difficulty curve. Things are just kind of always in the middle, like at the beginning of the game, things are not that hard. And then once you evolve, things get even easier. And what I'm noticing, if we look at my Johto leaderboard, is that all of the results are sort of clustering around the same area in terms of time. And it is becoming harder to differentiate Pokemon. 
This also leads to another unfortunate side effect of doing solo challenges, which is not how the game is supposed to be played anyways. When I use a Pokemon that needs a stone to evolve, like Arcanine, do I just start with the first stage and then wait for all the moves that it can learn and then teach it to them and then use the Firestone? Because if you're going to use a Firestone in the Johto games, you have to wait until you get to Kanto. So if I was saying doing Arcanine vs. Ninetales in the Johto games, I would probably start fully evolved. So then do I have to rank those Pokemon on a completely different leaderboard than the ones that I used Evolution with? And then the Pokemon that I played using Evolution, like for instance Swinub and Piloswine, Will I just never do a Swinub video because I've already played the first portion of that playthrough with Swinub already? And will I never just start with Piloswine and then rank it against the Pokemon that started fully evolved? So yes, while evolution is a key mechanic in Pokemon, I don't think it holds up very well when doing these solo challenges. For me, it is far more interesting to just start with a species and finish with that same species. Now all of that said, of course I'm evolving today, so why is that the case? Well, uh, if you didn't know, and you might not know if you're not a content creator, but all of these videos were filmed so far in advance. Like some of the content that I've released during these daily uploads was filmed back in March. So this Butterfree playthrough I played before I had really determined what my approach was going to be for Fire Red and Leaf Green, but I have now decided that I'm just going to be starting either as a first stage Pokemon and not evolving, or as a fully evolved Pokemon or like in some cases as a middle evolution, but those are going to be like the edge cases and there's not going to be very many of those videos. So I've totally glossed over it to this point, but I actually did lose twice using a Caterpie here in the early portion of the game. It's uh, kind of annoying. This thing's pretty weak. At least once it evolves to a Butterfree, it learns Confusion, and that's going to be very helpful against Brock. But we do need to go over how different he is between these games and the games in Generation 1. Because in Generation 1, he doesn't have any rock moves, but in Generation 3, he does. And so while Butterfree was like the perfect Pokemon to defeat him in Pokemon Yellow, in Fire Red and Leaf Green, that really isn't the case, because rock moves deal four times damage to it. So I'm a bit worried for this fight. I did level up to level 13 over one more damage rounding threshold, so hopefully this works out. Brock leads with Geodude, and if you're wondering where my gym leader intro is, uh, we haven't made it yet. We're going to make those in early January when we have more time. Okay, now let's get on with the fight. I use Confusion. It does more than half. Geodude uses Tackle, doing a little bit to Butterfree, and then I knock it out. Okay, it's time for the Onyx. By the way, I do realize that I did not heal at the beginning of this fight. That's very sloppy. Onyx goes for Rock Tomb, does so much, and knocks Butterfree out in a single hit. All right, so that's kind of what I was expecting. However, now I need to talk about Compound Eyes, because if I level up to the next damage rounding threshold, which is 15, Butterfree is going to learn Sleep Powder as well. And this move becomes so good when you have this ability. Compound Eyes increases the accuracy of moves used by the Pokemon by multiplying the original original accuracy by a factor of 1.3. So because Sleep Powder has 75% accuracy, if we multiply that by 1.3, we get 97.5%. So there's only a 2.5% chance that Sleep Powder misses today, which is absolutely fantastic. I am sure that I'm going to be able to beat Brock now that I have this move. I knock the Geodude out with two hits and move on to the Onyx. Now Butterfree is fast enough, so I put it to sleep right away, and then I can take it out with Confusion. It only takes three hits, and with that, I've earned myself the first badge. Now Fire Red and Leaf Green is the last game in the Pokemon Main Series games that includes badge boosts. So Brock's badge, of course, gives me a 10% boost to my attack stat. Yes, these boosts are 10% in Generation 3, whereas they are 12.5% boosts in Generation 1. So let's move out onto the next route, and here I am going to fight all of the optional trainers. I have learned in Pokemon Emerald that skipping trainers in Generation 3 doesn't make a lot of sense, because the game's difficulty really ramps up later on. Also in Generation 1, I have things like the badge boost glitch as well as stat experience on my side that can really make my Pokemon extra powerful in the late game, Whereas in these games, EVs, or effort values, are going to cap out much earlier on, and I have no ability to stack the badge boosts. 
One nice trick I have in Mount Moon that I picked up in Generation 1 is to grab the escape rope, and then when I'm running low on PP, I can use it to teleport out to the entrance of the cave, heal up at the Pokemon Center, and then proceed back to the cave. Today I actually headed back to Pewter City, picked up some extra Pokeballs, and then in the tunnel I grabbed myself a Paris. After all, I'm going to need it for HMs because there's no free Charmander in this game. I grab the Aether on this rock, and then I pick up this TM, which I was expecting to be Mega Punch, but no, this is Thief in this case. Very interesting. There are a lot of things that I am going to have to learn in these games. However, one thing I know is that there's this super nerd. He has the same Pokemon, which pose no threat to Butterfree today. There is a Voltorb, but like, why would a Voltorb get electric type moves? That doesn't make any sense. Anyways, I defeat him. Butterfree has a chance to learn Whirlwind, which, uh, no, still bad in these games. And then I can grab myself the fossil. Of course, the dome fossil is the best choice. Think about it. You are closer to the exit of Mount Moon if you pick up the fossil on this side, right? Like, obviously, this is clearly the speedrunner's strategy of choice. So as I go to exit the cave, we can actually see a neat little addition that they made in these games. They put an antidote right here in this Pokeball. That's so convenient. There were so many times as a kid when I was exiting Mount Moon, my last Pokemon was poisoned, and then I blacked out before I made it to the Cerulean City Pokemon Center and just like rage quit. And my mom was probably like, these games are not very good for him. We need to take them away. <laughs> so yeah, thank you Game Freak for putting this antidote here so that all the people who are a little bit younger than me did not have the same experience. Next, of course, is Cerulean City, and in here, I have to figure out where the rare candy is. Like, normally in yellow version, it's up here, but doesn't look like it's there today. Maybe it's down here, a little bit lower. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so I found it. Good. Of course, next, I have a choice. Do I want to face the rival on Nugget Bridge, or do I want to face Misty in the gym? And I think today, the rival makes more sense. After all, I don't have particularly good damage against Misty's Starmie, so I want to be overleveled for that fight. He leads with Pidgeotto, and uh, this is not a great Pokemon to go up against when you're a Butterfree. I go for Sleep Powder and I get the 2.5% chance that it misses, and then Pidgeotto uses Sand Attack. Ah, <sighs> that is the worst possible thing. Luckily on the next turn I put it to sleep and now I can start hitting it with confusion, but it just wakes up right away, hits Gust, so I decide to just continue attacking and knock it out over two more turns. That does mean that I have just above half health left for the next Pokemon, and here I learn something about Fire Red and Leaf Green. This rival will choose to send in the Pokemon that is super effective against your Pokemon next because he chooses Charmander. Okay, Sleep Powder, please work. It does, putting the fire type to sleep, and then confusion knocks it out over two turns. All right, perfect. Next, the rival uses Abra. Why does he have Abra in this fight? It is completely useless. It's also level 16. It should be a Kadabra by now. Uh, anyways, he stopped it from evolving, I guess. I knock it out, move on to the Rattata. It does use Quick Attack, dealing some damage, but not enough, and my confusion knocks it out. So, I've made it by butt. Yes, in Fire Red as well, he will be named this for all of my challenges. Do not worry. And then in Bill's house, oh, Bill turned himself into a Clefairy in these games. Interesting. Also, the aesthetics of this lab is like, yeah, this is much better. I like it a lot more. Unfortunately, there is no cute Pikachu animation here because uh, these games are based on red and blue, so. Oh well. I grab the SS ticket and then I head back to Misty's gym. I decided that I was gonna fight the trainers here for some extra experience. And then I learned a lesson. I can actually sneak by the junior trainer who has Goldeen in this game. You can't do that in Generation 1. So that's pretty neat. Now, let's take on Misty. She leads with Staryu. Now because this thing's a mono water type, I just go for confusion right away. I get a lucky critical hit and knock it out. Perfect. Starmie is next. I go for Sleep Powder against it, putting it to sleep, and then I start using Tackle. This is going to take a while. I wanted to see if Confusion might do a little bit more damage even though it's resisted, and it looks like it is, like I can't tell, but Confusion does have the secondary effect where it could confuse the Starmie, so I want to use this move instead. However, Starmie wakes up and it uses Recover. Okay, so that could make a lot of playthroughs very hard here. It is so nice that Misty does not have that move in Generation 1. After putting it back to sleep, I continue attacking with Confusion. This confuses it so that the next time it wakes up, it damages itself. However, then Misty uses a Super Potion. In Generation 3, they really wanted to give all the gym leaders healing items. I, I get why, because like X Defend in Generation 1 is not good, but the Super Potions are a huge nuisance. 
Still, because of the power of compound eyes, I am able to win this fight and earn myself the Cascade Badge. Okay, it's time to beat Rocket Man and get the TM for Dig. Uh, does he give you the TM for Dig? I hope he does. I one-shot the Machop, next is Drowsy, I decide to put it to sleep with Sleep Powder and uh, yeah, this thing has Insomnia, so that's unfortunate. I guess I am not going to be putting any Drowsies to sleep. It uses Disable, disabling Sleep Powder anyways, so that's perfect. I use Tackle, Drowsy does very little with Headbutt. This thing uh, did not age well. Drowsy's so good in Generation 1, and then it got so much worse in Generation 2. I knock it out, and with that, I get the chance to learn Gust. So this is a same type attack bonus move, and it's better than Tackle at least, but it's probably not going to see a lot of play today. So it looks like this rocket does in fact give me TM28, and in Generation 3, this is still Dig. I should mention though that it isn't nearly as good as it is in Generation 1, because in Generation 1 it has base 100 power, but starting in Generation 2, until the end of Generation 3, this move had 60 base power. It was actually upgraded to 80 base power in Generation 4, which I do think makes sense after all it is a two turn move. On Route 6, before I fight the trainers, I decide to catch myself some uh, HM friends. Thanks again, Squidgy, for the term. Here, I can use Sleep Powder to catch myself a Pidgey. And then it's time to defeat the trainers heading into Vermilion City. So, the first one is Picnic or Isabel. She is a replacement for Junior Trainer Sandy from the Generation 1 games. Yes, she has the same team, but no, she is not the same trainer because she is a picnicker. Still, I'm sure these birds are great at ruining your accuracy, but not today because Confusion one-shots all of them. Next is the SSN, and uh, cue music here because look at this. There is a room that doesn't exist in the Generation 1 games. I wonder what could be in this room. Oh, it's this person. And guess what happens when you talk with her? She heals you. So... While it isn't a healing bed, it is a healing person, so I guess that's nice. I defeat this sailor, pick up the TM that's behind him, which is rest, by the way, they did not change that. Now while I'm here, I want to fight some extra trainers. Here there's actually a chance for me to explain one of my rules, which is if a Pokemon uses Roar and drags out my solo Pokemon, I just have to switch back in. I could force a reset in cases like this because in some rare instances that actually helps my solo Pokemon, like in the case that it had its accuracy decreased. But I'm not going to do that because then I would have to save in front of every battle where the trainer could use Roar. And in most cases, they just Roar you out and then you switch back in and take free damage. So I do think that this is the best way to play these situations. I continue my training and I fight the guy who normally blocks Body Slam. But in these games, he blocks Brick Break. Honestly, I would much rather have Body Slam. Can we please have TM08 back from Generation 1? But I guess Brick Break is more interesting, and it is nice to have an early move for fighting types because they really had it bad in Generation 1. Also, this move has 100% accuracy, which is just a breath of fresh air after moves like Low Kick, Submission, Rolling Kick, High Jump Kick. Ah, oh, the Generation 1 fighting moves are so bad. Okay, I'm rambling now, so let's fight the rival on the SSN. He once again leads with Pidgeotto, but this time I do not miss with Sleep Powder and I put it to sleep. Still, it wakes up on the next turn and uses Sand Attack anyways. This thing is determined to make me have a bad day. However, Compound Eyes makes my moves more accurate, and I think that that interacts with my accuracy being lowered. So it's like it lowers my accuracy, but then Compound Eyes boosts my accuracy again, because I'm not really missing that much. Next, he sends in Charmeleon, I put it to sleep, and I knock it out with two uses of Confusion. Raticate's next, oh no, oh no. W what is this sprite? <laughs> this is a bad sprite. This is like Gen 1 tier. What is Raticate do? He looks so chunky. Maybe it's a good sprite. I kind of like it now. Oh gosh, though, it is not flattering. I knock it out, or I kill it, and then he sends out Kadabra. I go for the physical move in the form of Gust, and it takes it down in one hit. Okay, so I've made it to Lieutenant Surge, but before I leave the ship behind me, I'm going to stop by the healing room one more time. This place is glorious after all. And no, this room does not exist in Generation 1. <laughs> ah... Anyways, let's move on to Surge's gym. Now here you'll see me trying to solve the trash can puzzle, and this is something that has not appeared on the channel in forever, because in Generation 1 I have my software solve this puzzle for me so that no RNG creeps into the Pokemon's time. Now despite my best effort, I have not yet been able to locate the flag that controls this trash can puzzle in the Fire Red RAM, so if you know the RAM offset for this, it has to be the like full 4 byte number for it, uh, please let me know because I would like to be able to solve it with my software once again. Either way, this run is going to be a little bit hard to rank with other runs just because I'm playing from a Caterpie into a Butterfree, not just starting as a Butterfree itself. Okay, now let's take on Lieutenant Surge. 
He leads with Voltorb. It's kind of weird that in the Generation 3 games, both Watson and Surge start with a Voltorb. Like, it is the case in Emerald, it isn't in Ruby and Sapphire, but he does have a Voltorb on his team in those games. This one gets really annoying, I put it to sleep and it doesn't get knocked out so he uses a potion, like, ugh. Pikachu is next, Butterfree is still faster so I put it to sleep. Surge uses a full heal, okay, he has one of those, interesting. And then I knock it out on the next turn, so I probably should have just attacked there. Now it's time for his ace. Raichu comes out, I go for sleep powder, and because I'm over leveled at this point, I just put it to sleep, and then do a lot of damage with confusion. It wakes up, paralyzes me, hits a shockwave, but I knock it out on the next turn. So coming into these games, I was really expecting much more of a challenge than Generation 1, but I think just the piece of knowledge that I should be training on most optional trainers is giving me a much smoother playthrough than I would have had otherwise. So I guess in this case, some of the experience that I have in Pokemon Emerald is translating over into these games. Heading out onto Route 9, I have to face the Wrapping Lass. We're going to figure out what her name is today, and in this case, her name is Alicia. During the fight, Butterfree levels up to level 34, and it gets the chance to learn Psybeam, which is going to be a fantastic replacement for Confusion. But I want to be able to use more attacking moves to knock out trainers and that sort of thing, so I'll unlearn Poison Powder in this case. After all, Poison is like the worst status condition. I finish her team off, and then I head into Rock Tunnel. Here, it's good to see that Pokemaniac Ashton still has not leveled up his Cubone or his Slowpoke, so I finish them off, and with that, I get to face the self-destructing hiker. And I cannot emphasize enough how awesome it is that they named this guy Dudley. That is the perfect name. Luckily, all of his self-destructing rocks do not have very much special defense, so Butterfree just sweeps through them with Psybeam. And with that, I have made it to the mid-game. Uh... There is no little tree here for the max ether to be hidden on, but the ground is actually different. Look at that, there's like a little dark shadow here, like there's a hidden item there. Oh, it's a, it's a berry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now I have made it to Celadon City. And here I should mention a difference between the first generation games and these third generation remakes. And that is the fact that the rocket hideout is no longer an optional area. In Generation 1, if you pick up the Pokedoll, you can use it to bypass Marowak. There is debate whether this is a glitch, whether this is an exploit. I don't think it matters, at least it doesn't matter for me. I like to play that way. I just prefer to not have the bloat that is the rocket hideout. It's not very interesting in terms of the trainers you have to fight. And I also made the decision early on in my series, so I'm not changing it now. However, in Generation 3, since you can't skip the ghost in this way, a lot of people would say that yes, it is a glitch in Generation 1 that you can skip it that way. Um, Anyways, you can debate about it in the comments. Either way, I don't really care. Today we have to do the hideout. Let's do it. A lot of the items have been changed between games. So like over here where there's supposed to be a nugget, there's an X speed, which is absolutely useless for me. This is TM12, which is taunt. Also not that useful. On the next floor, there's this trainer. He has two Machops, which I can easily finish off with Psybeam. So it's basically free experience. There's this item that he blocks. And in Generation 1, it's Double Edge, which is really useful. But in this case, it's Frustration. Not going to be useful at all. After all, I'm using one Pokemon. They're really going to like me by this point in the playthrough. Also, I'll just note here that I'm like walking around, clicking on every tile. And you're like, why are you doing that? In Generation 1, there's a nugget over here. I was seeing if there was a nugget here in this case, but it doesn't look like there is. Still, while most of the items to this point have been useless, there is a useful item here, which is the black glasses. These boost the power of dark type moves by 10%. So whenever I'm using a dark Pokemon, that's going to be useful. Also, they didn't remove the rare candy, which is great. On the next floor, where there's usually an HP up, there is now a max ether. Okay, that's that's actually kind of useful. I grab the lift key, pick up a calcium, and then I face Giovanni. He leads with Onyx, and in Generation 1, this would not be scary, but in Generation 2, it kind of is. Maybe it has rock moves. My Psybeam doesn't knock it out. It survives on yellow. And yes, in this generation, it is yellow. In Generation 1 and 2, it really is orange. At least I see orange whenever I look at the health bars. So I'll refer to this as yellow and that as orange. Anyways, small detail. I do knock the Onyx out. I move on to the Rhyhorn. This thing is going to get scary later on. However, in this fight, it's no problem. I finish it off and he sends out his ace, Kangaskhan. It's really cool because Giovanni has a rotating ace. He always has a different Pokemon as his most powerful Pokemon. And uh, this one is so frustrating. It uses Bite over and over again and just keeps making me flinch. Finally, I hit a critical hit with Psybeam, which takes the Kangaskhan down to low health. It confuses it as well, but it still uses Bite. However, my next Psybeam finishes it off. So with that, Giovanni teleports out of the hideout, and I almost forget the Silph Scope, but I go back and get it, don't worry. 
Now let's make the trip to the department store and see what TMs are available here. So, uh, Roar is a TM. That's a weird TM. Hyperbeam is a TM. All right, it's nice that I can actually buy this move here. In Generation 1, you have to buy 50 coins at a time in the game corner. It takes forever. But uh, Hyperbeam is not nearly as good because you have to recharge in this game. So maybe to defeat the occasional ace Pokemon here and there. Notably, Dig can be repurchased as well as Brick Break, Secret Power, and Attract. I am sure all of those TMs are going to see play in this generation. After that, I grab myself some super repels and sell all the items that I am not going to need. I do this so that I can buy vitamins for Butterfree. But before that, I want to check out the TMs that I can get access to with the vending machine. So by giving this girl some drinks, she will give you TMs. And in this case, she gives TM 16, which is light screen. She also gives TM 20, which is safeguard. And finally, she gives TM 33, which is reflect. So status moves that help protect your Pokemon. Honestly, not as useful as Ice Beam, Rock Slide, and Tri-Attack, which are the Generation 1 TMs, but I'm sure that these will all have their place. On the floor below, I buy Calcium for Butterfree to raise its special attack effort values, and now I am ready to pick up one of the best TMs for my Butterfly, and that is Psychic in Saffron City. I teach it in the place of confusion, and with that, I am off to Pokemon Tower to defeat the rival. So in this fight, he still has a Pidgeotto. I'm sure it's gonna get really annoying. Instead of trying to put it to sleep because that hasn't been working, I just go for Psychic and it takes it down. Perfect. Charmeleon's next. I continue going for Psychic, it knocks it out. After all, my Butterfree is level 40 right now. It's really high. I kept spamming Psychic and I really shouldn't have done this against the Execute. Anyways, it uh, puts me to sleep, which is super annoying. I'll just take this time to mention that if you look in the bottom center, you will notice that my move's powers are not dynamically updating like they do in any of my other challenges. And that's because I have to still do some development on the Fire Red and Leaf Green front end to make it work the same way. So hopefully by the next video, which should come late in January, I will have that working for all of you. The only thing factored in right now is the same type attack bonus, which you can see in the effective power of Gust. The last Pokemon on the rivals team is Gyarados. I finish it off and with that I am moving on to the Chandlers, who are obviously very easy for Butterfree to deal with with psychic moves. I pick up the rare candy, which is still here, and then I go up against the Ghost Marowak. I just want to say here that Alolan Marowak is such a nice nod to this Marowak from Generation 1. Anyways, it's easy for Butterfree to defeat, and with that I finish off all the rockets at the top of the tower, grab myself the Poke Flute, and then I realize that I don't have the bike. Okay, so back to Vermilion City, grab the bike voucher, then to Cerulean City, pick up the bicycle, and then instead of heading to Cycling Road, let's actually take on Erica. After all, she has Grass Poison types, so Psychic is super effective. But before I do that, I polish off the trainers in her gym, earning myself a couple more levels, and with that, I'm ready to go. Erica leads with Victory Bell. In Generation 1, this thing is a beast because it always gets critical hits with Razor Leaf, but here today, it shouldn't be that bad. Psychic one hits. Next is Tangela. I go for Psychic, and it also is a one hit. Okay, so the Vile Plume's going down as well. That was an easy gym. Now I should mention the rewards that these gym leaders give because they are not the same as they were in Generation 1. In Generation 1, Brock gives Bide, which is sometimes useful to defeat Misty. Misty gives Bubble Beam, which is quite good in the early mid game, and sometimes against Giovanni's Rhydon. Then Surge gives Thunderbolt, Erica gives Mega Drain, Koga gives Toxic, which is useful in some niche situations, Blaine gives Fire Blast, Sabrina gives the worst TM of them all, Psy Wave, which I don't think I've ever used, I don't think I ever will use, and finally Giovanni gives Fissure. So I'd say that like 50% of those moves are exceptional and are used all the time. However, in Generation 3, that really isn't the case. It feels like what they did was they said, we're going to take all the really bad TMs and remove those. We're going to take all the really good TMs and we're going to remove those. And the TMs that the leaders give you are just going to be kind of middle of the road moves. For instance, Brock gives Rock Tomb, which is a nice rock move, but it's not really that good. It's no rock slide. Misty gives Water Pulse, which is okay, but it's not as good as Bubble Beam. Surge gives Shock Wave, which is no Thunderbolt, but it's nice that it can't miss. And then Erica here gives Giga Drain, which is a lot better than Mega Drain. In this case, it's actually nice that we get a better grass type move that has 100% accuracy but uh, Giga Drain's PP is not very big. I'll continue talking about the Gym Leader TMs as I fight all the trainers here on Cycling Road. After all, in Emerald, the late game is very challenging, so I don't want to go into that section of the game under-leveled with Butterfree. If you watched my Butterfree video last year when I played Emerald for the first time, I got like a ridiculous time, it's like five hours, and going into this playthrough, I was thinking that that sort of thing would repeat, 
After all, this is the last of my daily releases, and I really didn't want to have to do like a five to six hour challenge. In that case, it would really push my stress levels up. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to do that. So I'm just training. I'm just making sure that everything is going to go smoothly later on in the game. All right, back to gym leader TMs. Koga gives the TM for Toxic, as he does in Generation 1, and then Sabrina gives the TM for Calm Mind, which is much better than Psywave, definitely the most improved TM of all of them. Blaine still gives Fire Blast, despite the fact that Flamethrower is a TM. Why does he give you Fire... Ah, just so frustrating. Anyways, he gives Fire Blast. And Giovanni in this case gives Earthquake instead of Fissure, so that is also a big improvement, and that's a really useful TM. So I spent a lot of time kind of complaining about how these TMs are not quite as good as the ones that are given out in Generation 1, like specifically Thunderbolt and Bubble Beam, those moves are good. But this update in Generation 3, I think balances the game a lot better, so that Pokemon don't get too outrageously powerful early on and just allow you to sweep through with great ease. I complete the Safari Zone, give the Warden the Gold Teeth, and then I grab the Rare Candy. With that out of the way, let's head into Koga's Gym and defeat the trainers here. Honestly, they're not much of a threat, even though Butterfree has to use Gust at most points here. I level up to level 47, where I learn Silverwind in the place of Psybeam, and then I go up against Koga. His team here is the same as his red and blue team, so it's quite different from my Pokemon Yellow videos. He leads with a Coughing, of course, Psychic one hits it. Next is Muck. I was hoping for a one hit here, but it only takes it to yellow. Muck uses Minimize, and then I hit on the next turn, knocking it out. Okay, that's perfect. Coughing's next, I take it down, and that leads to his ace, Wheezing. Now this thing is known for using self-destruct. I don't know if it has explosion or self-destruct in this game. We'll have to wait and find out, but today I just get a critical hit with Psychic, so it goes down in one hit. And with that, I've earned myself the fifth badge, which is the soul badge. And in this game, it correctly boosts your defense stat. So Surge's badge is the one that boosts your speed. And that's really nice because so many times in Pokemon Yellow, I'm just like trying to get more speed only for the mid game. So that's not going to be a problem in the remakes. Next, I head to Sylph, and at this point, I've started to realize that I think I've overtrained to this point of the game. So I can cut some trainers now and head to the rival right away. He leads with Pidgeot. I put it to sleep, go for Psychic. It does more than half. It keeps sleeping, and then my next Psychic knocks it out. Okay, no sand attacks this time. Next, he sends in Charizard. I'm going to need to put this one to sleep so I don't get hit by a Fire-type move. Unfortunately, though, it wakes up on the next turn, uses Scary Face, and then hits a huge Flamethrower before I put it back to sleep. All right, I cannot get hit again. But unfortunately, it wakes up and knocks Butterfree out. That's actually my first reset since Brock. So maybe I over-anticipated how difficult these games would be. In the next fight, I polish the Charizard off with Sleep, move on to the Execute. Here, I go for Silver Wind because it does four times damage and it could Omni Boost me, but I don't get it in this case. Alakazam's next, I outspeed, hit with Silver Wind and knock it out in one turn. It's nice to have a good bug type move to knock psychic types out with, in contrast to my regular experience in Generation 1. Next is Gyarados, Psychic does almost half. I go for another one, and because I got a special defense drop, it knocks Gyarados out. So with that, I have earned myself the Surfing Pokemon Lapras of... Uh, what? This is the, the worst sprite ever. Like, I said the Raticate sprite was bad, but it's bad in like a kind of good way. Like, oh yeah, like Chunky Raticate looks great. This one, I don't know. What is happening with Lapras's mouth and its eyes? Like, uh... So I, I do have to look at that for every challenge that I do. Well, moving on, let's face Giovanni. And uh, this one is not going to be hard. Psychic 1 hits his first two Pokemon. Kangaskhan comes out to take it down over two hits. And last is Nidoqueen. But Psychic's super effective here. While it doesn't one hit, the Nidoqueen just uses Poison Sting. Apparently Giovanni is very similar to how he is in red and blue. <laughs> so I knock it out. And uh, yeah, after that I head to Copycat's house. And here I realize that she is a move tutor now. She does not actually give you a TM which makes things a bit more tricky because now I can't teach Mimic whenever I want to. Like, I can't teach it mid-league. Also, Mimic does work differently in these games. You only Mimic the last used move, so it's not going to be useful right now. Let's head to Sabrina's gym. By the way, this place looks really cool in Generation 3. She leads with Kadabra, and here I have Silverwind, so I'm hoping for the Omni Boost at some point early on in this fight so that I can use it throughout the rest of the fight. I knock it out, and next she sends in Venomoth. So this thing is obviously a fire rock type. So you might be wondering, since Venomoth is now my channel mascot, why I'm not doing my first playthrough in Fire Red with it? Well, I am going to do a Venomoth playthrough this week. It's going to be on December 31st. 
and it's going to be Venomoth in Generation 2, so uh, stay tuned for that video. Mr. Mime is next, I go for Silverwind, take it out in one hit, and all that's left is the Alakazam, and I just critical hit it, and that's where I get my Omni Boost, are you kidding me? Fine, at least I know now that I can get it after I knock Pokemon out in these games. By the way, if you knock the Pokemon out in Generation 2, you cannot get the Omni Boost. So that's why in my Aerodactyl playthrough I was just never getting it. I surfed to Cinnabar Island, which is a painful task in these games because they decided to make all of these rocks asymmetrical and I can't just surf in one straight line. Ugh, I do not like this. Pokemon Mansion's next, and they changed the positioning of Blizzard. This is now Blizzard. I thought there might be a rare candy around here somewhere, but I couldn't find it. By the way, I will pick up rare candies later on. Then I noticed that the secret key is where Solar Beam used to be, and Solar Beam is where the secret key used to be. I am looking for uh, rare candies in this room too, but I can't find any once again. So with all these items in my bag, now let's face Blaine. He leads with a Growlithe, Intimidate's useless here, I knock it out with Psychic, Ponyta's next. I don't knock it out, but it just misses a Fire Blast. Okay, Blaine uses a Hyper Potion. Hey, he upgraded from Super Potions, that's perfect. My next Psychic doesn't knock it out, but I get two in a row. Well, he uses another Hyper Potion, so I get three Psychics in a row and knock the Ponyta out. Rapidash comes in next, and here I'm gonna have to use Sleep Powder. I get the 2.5% chance to miss. It goes for Fire Blast, doing more than half to me, but Butterfree hangs on. My next Sleep Powder puts it to sleep, I use Psychic, but Blaine uses a full heal first, and then I connect, doing about half to the Flaming Horse. But I put it back to sleep, and knock it out with Psychic. Okay, so before I narrate Arcanine, because it's going to go the same way as Rapidash, I just want you to look down in the bottom left. You can notice here that my stage modifiers aren't showing up. That is also something that I will be adding to my overlay in the coming days once I have more time in January to get back to programming. I very intentionally stopped doing all the programming work that I was doing in November just so that I could produce all of these videos and then I'll be switching back once I go back to weekly releases to improving the quality of the videos. So, Butterfree finishes off the Arcanine, and with that, I have earned myself the Volcano Badge. With it comes a boost to my special attack and my special defense, and there is no glitch in this game, so I get both of them. Outside the gym, Bill stops me and he's like, hey dude, I'm a billionaire, come ride with me on this yacht and come to my private islands, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And then I go on the boat and go to the private islands, and then he's like, actually, you're stuck here now, you can't leave the islands until you complete this thing that I want you to do, and I'm like, Actually, can I just go back? I want to go back and uh, keep beating the game. What if I said no to you on Cinnabar Island? In that case, would you have just left me there? Like, I don't want to be here. And then I went and looked it up because I was like, I don't know how to beat these islands because I've only played Generation 1. Honestly, the first time I played Fire Red and Leaf Green, I just stopped playing once I got to these islands because I was so confused. It's like, what is this place? I have no idea where to go. I don't know what to do. That's actually when I put the games down and stopped playing until X and Y. I think at some point I did come back and complete the game before I played X and Y, but I really have almost no memory of that. What really sticks out in my mind is just getting frustrated with these islands. And uh, yeah, I looked it up in speedruns and you just say no to Bill and then he leaves and you don't waste any time, so whoops. <laughs> Anyways, in this case I actually find Moltres and I battle it and then it just like knocks Butterfree out, so <laughs> that's my fifth reset. Uh, I tried again and this time I successfully put it to sleep and defeat it. After all that, I have to defeat a biker gang, which levels Butterfree up even more. So I guess this place is useful if you need more experience before you face Giovanni or the League. Maybe that will be helpful for Butterfree. After all, I don't want to get stuck on like Lance or the Champion or something like that. I rescue a small child from an extremely creepy Hypno. And after that, I finally earn my passage back to Kanto. I just want to reflect on the fact that when I was a kid in Pokemon Yellow, I had a level 80 Butterfree, and I could not defeat Giovanni. Mostly because I accidentally forgot Sleep Powder for Psybeam. But uh, yeah, it was really difficult to defeat Giovanni with a Butterfree. So I am not hopeful for how this is going to go today. After all, aren't these games supposed to be harder? Let's find out. Giovanni leads with a Rhyhorn. A Rhyhorn and it's level 45? Are you kidding me? That's not that difficult. Okay, so Psychic knocks it out in one hit. Next, he sends in level 50 Rhyhorn. What is happening? I go for Psychic, and it knocks it out in one hit. Okay, so that's perfect. Next, he sends in his Doug Trio, and uh, it's level 42. Also, the sprite here makes this thing look like Wug Trio. Also, Wug Trio. What is that Pokemon? I gotta do a solo Wug Trio challenge. That would be really hard. That thing is so frail. Anyways, I knock the Doug Trio out and move on to the Nidoqueen. 
Psychic one-shots it, and Psychic one-shots the Nido King. So with that, I have earned the Earth Badge. It was incredibly easy. I see now that the developers really took inspiration from Red and Blue, and uh, not from Yellow, because Giovanni is much more difficult in Yellow. That is a little disappointing, so I guess Giovanni is never going to be a challenge in these games. He doesn't even have a ride on. I did say earlier that his Rhyhorn was going to become problematic, but yeah, it's not, so that's that. Let's move on to the rival before the league. He leads with Pidgeot. Okay, I'm just going to try and knock this thing out with Psychic. Ah, uh, it doesn't work. Okay, fine. He uses Feather Dance, which harshly lowers my attack stat. Okay, I think that's okay. I finish the Pidgeot off. Next is Rhyhorn. I one hit it. Next is Charizard. I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. Hit one Psychic and then it uses Scary Face. Ah. This lets it get a Flamethrower in, taking Butterfree down to 28 health. And then I knock it out with Sleep Powder and two more Psychics. It's time for the Execute, but now because my attack was harshly lowered, I don't one hit it with Silver Wind and it paralyzes me. Because of that, Butterfree is not very fast, and Alakazam knocks it out with Psychic. Okay, there is a simple solution here. Use Sleep Powder against the Pidgeot so that it can't use Feather Dance, and then knock it out with two Psychics. Next is Rhyhorn. Why is he sending the Rhyhorn in next, not the Charizard? I guess the Rhyhorn has a type advantage with Rock over Bug Flying, but uh, yeah, it's bad, so I knock it out. Next is Charizard, put it to sleep, and then I take it out with three uses of Psychic. Luckily, it does not wake up. Executes next, with my attack stat fully intact, I take it down in one hit. Alakazam comes out, I go for Silver Wind, and here I knock it out, getting the Omni Boost. Perfect. Because now I have a buff Butterfree. By the way, I played Generation 1 with a Butterfree using only physical moves at the very beginning of my channel, so uh, go check it out if you haven't seen it. It's uh, pretty bad, it's an old one. Anyways, I knocked the Gyarados out with two Psychics, and with that, I have cleared all of the major trainers before the league. And then at the very end of Victory Road, I uh, make a pathing mistake, and I run into these two. Like, oh no. They have a Nidoqueen and a Nidoking, so I guess, oh great, I'm out of power points for Psychic. So I guess I'm going to have to put them to sleep, and then hope that I knock them out slowly. But uh, yeah, this is too much for Butterfree, and as a result, they... Uh, yeah, they finish me off. The problem with that is that the last time I saved was before the rival. I really should have just known that I can path around these trainers and not fought them, but at least I'm able to defeat the rival on my next attempt as well, so I don't get stuck there for any time. And with that, I have cleared all of the game, and I am ready to take on the Elite Four for the first time. Now let's try this at the level that I arrived at, which is level 60. Lorelai's first, she leads with Dugong, I put it to sleep, and then I use Silver Wind in the hopes that I can get an Omni Boost before I move on to the rest of the fight. And I actually do with my third one, okay that's nice. I finish the Dugong off, move on to the Slowbro, put it to sleep, and since Silver Wind is super effective here, I can use it once again. I get an Omni Boost right away, and then I knock the Slowbro out. So, while that is good that I got the Omni Boost, I'm now out of PP for this move, and I would really like to use it against the Jinx. However, what I'm going to have to do is put the Jinx to sleep and then use Gust to knock it out. It takes care of it in two turns, and in my first attempt, I have made it to Lorelei's Ace. Oh no, it's this sprite again. <laughs> I guess I always have to look at this thing, because I have to face Lorelei even if I don't get the Lapras. And with the boosts, my Butterfree takes it out over two turns. Okay, she didn't send in her Cloister earlier in the fight, so I'm going to have to finish that now, but Psychic 1 hits it. With that, I have made it to the next trainer, who is, in this case, Bruno. I know in Generation 1 this guy doesn't exist, but in Generation 3 he does. I go up against his Onyx, and I'm like, yeah, it has bad special defense, so I'll just use Psychic and take it down, but uh, Psychic doesn't knock it out. It goes for Rock Tomb, and it one-shots Butterfree with a critical hit. Might be the fastest I have ever lost in this room. Okay, so let's reset. I have six rare candies, so let's use those and try again. This time, things against Lorelei don't go as well. The Slowbro wakes up, hits me with Ice Beam, which does a lot, but even with that, Compound Eyes in combination with Sleep Powder is just way too good, plus Butterfree's fast. So I make it through Lorelei's team again. As a kid with my level 80 Butterfree, I couldn't get by her in yellow version. So in this case, Butterfree's new ability is really the thing that improved this Pokemon from Generation 1 into Generation 3. But now, can I defeat Bruno? Let's see. So I go for Sleep Powder this time to put the Onyx to sleep, and then I roll damage for Psychic, and in this case, because I'm a higher level, I knock it out in one hit. Hitmonchan's next. Now this thing got a lot of special defense when it was split in Generation 2, and as a result it survives my Psychic and goes for Rock Tomb, which does a lot. Bruno uses a full restore. I decided to try to see how much Gust would do, 
doesn't do very much. I put Hitmonchan back to sleep and then knock it out. Next, Bruno sends in Machamp. Now I am going to have to put this thing to sleep because it's decently bulky and it's probably not going to go down to a single Psychic. It doesn't, it heals with a Citrus Berry, but I finish it on the next turn. Okay, time for Hitmonlee. But it moves first, hits a Mega Kick, and Butterfree just barely survives. However, Bruno uses a full restore on it, saving it, and because it's outspeeding, it takes Butterfree down. So now it's time to collect the rare candies that I forgot in Kanto because they are in weird places. So there is no longer a rare candy on the SSN, which I thought there would be. Instead, the rare candy is outside of the tunnel that takes you to Vermilion City up here. It's a hidden item. Then on the route to Rock Tunnel, there is actually a hidden rare candy by this hiker who is running back and forth. It's like right here by this ledge. What a strange place to put a rare candy. Next, I realized that I actually forgot the rare candy in the Warden's house, so I go back and pick that up. And then in Pokemon Mansion, there is a rare candy just past this trainer as a hidden item over here. So now that I have a few more levels, I realized that I was neglecting something that I really shouldn't have been, and that is the move tutor with Dream Eater. After all, since I'm using Sleep Powder so heavily and I regularly outspeed, this move is going to be excellent for recovery. I teach it to Butterfree in the place of Gust, and then I head back to Sylph. In here, I'm looking for items that restore PP because I want a way to replenish my moves as I move through the league. Okay, so let's try this again. Now you'll notice here that I'm going into the Lorelei fight at level 62 without using my rare candies, because I was thinking that this fight was easy earlier, so I might as well just defeat her at the minimum level, hopefully gain some levels through this fight and the fight against Bruno, and then maybe use my rare candies before Agatha or before Lance. I think by doing this I might be able to squeeze out one additional level, but I am also able to squeeze out two additional resets against Lorelei before I finally defeat her. Okay, so it's time for Bruno, and I really think that Dream Eater is going to be what I need here. I just barely don't knock the Onyx out, that's annoying. Next is Hitmonchan, I go for Psychic against it, like, I don't know what I was thinking. It hits a Rock Tomb, lowering my speed, and as a result I don't move first and it finishes me on the next turn. It is very weird for his Hitmonchan to be scary. <gasps> In yellow version, the only reason it's scary is because it can cause status conditions. In the next fight, Onyx hits a massive rock tomb after Dream Eater doesn't finish it off. At least I survived. I finish it off with two psychics and move on to the Hitmonchan. I put it to sleep, use Dream Eater so that I heal, but it wakes up and knocks me out. I get to the Machamp in the next fight, and I actually survive its Rock Tomb with two hit points, but it doesn't matter and Bruno still finishes me off. Alright, so I think it's time to use Rare Candies. This is really going to make the fight easier. I can use 9 to take Butterfree up to level 72. And because I'm a higher level now, I'm just going to try and go for the KOs. I one hit the Onyx, one hit the Hitmonchan, and um, Machamp survives, hits a Rock Tomb, gets a critical hit, and knocks Butterfree out. That was bad luck. So I uh, accidentally clicked too fast, and I went into the Bruno fight at level 62 again, so we might as well try this. And then in this fight, I get surprisingly lucky, and I end up sweeping through his entire team. Okay, so I've made it to Agatha for the first time, and my Butterfree is only level 63. I'm going to use 5 rare candies here to take it up to level 68 over 2 more damage rounding thresholds. And because I have Psychic type moves, I think that I can sweep through most of her Poison type Pokemon. She leads with Gengar, I go for Psychic, Outspeed, and take it down in one hit. Alright, that's perfect. Next she sends in Golbat, and I don't expect this thing to be particularly strong. I use Psychic, and once again I get the one hit, so this is going really well so far. She sends in Arbok next, it intimidates Butterfree, but that's useless. I go for Psychic, it takes it out because it got a critical hit, so yeah, this is really easy. Final Gengar time. It's actually a lower level than it is in yellow. I don't knock it out. It survives on a sliver, but then it misses Hypnosis. Agatha uses a full restore. I re-roll Psychic, get a better damage range, and it goes down. So all that's left is Haunter, and no, this Pokemon is not going to survive a single hit. I take it out, and with that, I am moving on to Lance. So I just want to say here that you have the normal corridor you walk down, but then when you arrive in the room it just looks like another Elite Four member's chamber, and uh, Lance is standing in the middle of the room instead of at the end of the room by the door to the champion. Very interesting how they changed this. I think I prefer it in Generation 1, it gives this kind of like regalness to Lance because his chamber looks different, but anyways, let's take him on with Butterfree and see how this goes. Gyarados is his lead. I go for Sleep Powder, putting it to sleep, and then I use Dream Eater, which does almost half. Okay, so I'm going to need to do a little bit of chip damage here. What if I use Silver Wind and try and get an Omni Boost, but it does like 
almost nothing. Still, if I attack with a more powerful move, Lance is likely to use a full restore, so let's keep chipping away with Silverwind, and then I'll finish it off with Dream Eater. I do manage to pull this off, and next is Dragonite. Honestly, I really love this sprite. It looks so cute and kind of silly at the same time, while also being imposing. It's uh, perfect. 10 out of 10. I put it to sleep, use Dream Eater, it does about a third, it wakes up after my second Dream Eater and sets up Safeguard, so I can't put it to sleep again, so I'm going to have to use Psychic here to knock it out. Dragonite strikes with Hyper Beam, taking me down to yellow health. Nice. And then I finish it off. Next, Lance sends in Aerodactyl. Okay, so because of the former Safeguard, I won't be able to put it to sleep, so I have to go for Psychic and hope that I KO but Aerodactyl uses Ancient Power and finishes Butterfree off. So I still have some rare candies left, and I use them to take Butterfree up to level 73. Perfect, because it's over a damage rounding threshold. Against Gyarados, I preemptively go for Silverwind early on in the fight, get the Omni Boost right away, which is perfect. It wakes up using Dragon Rage, but it doesn't do very much. It's fixed damage after all. And because of my Omni Boost, my next Dream Eater does massive damage. Lance uses a full restore, but I finish it off with two Psychics. And then I get a third 2.5% chance to miss with Sleep Powder, and Dragonite sets up Safeguard. I clicked too fast, used another Sleep Powder, Dragonite goes for Wing Attack, doing about half to me, so now I have to use Psychic. My first hit does about half, Dragonite hits me with another Wing Attack, taking Butterfree to red, it heals with a Citrus Berry, and I thought all hope was lost, but I get a critical hit knocking it out. Aerodactyl's next. Because of Safeguard, I have to go for Psychic, but it doesn't do enough, so once again, it finishes me off. So the play that I'm really looking for here is where I put the Dragonite to sleep, prevent it from using Safeguard because it stays asleep, and then I can put the Aerodactyl to sleep and knock it out. This doesn't happen in the next fight, and as a result, once again, Butterfree goes down. And at this point, I briefly consulted my bag to see if there was maybe a TM that I could use to help improve my odds here, but like, I don't really think there is. Aerodactyl takes neutral damage from Giga Drain after all. However, in the next fight, I get lucky. I use two Dream Eaters against the Dragonite. It survives on a sliver. Lance uses a full restore, and then my next Psychic gets a critical hit, knocking it out. Alright, that's good. Aerodactyl's next. I outspeed, put it to sleep, and knock it out over two turns. So I've made it by Lance's first three Intimidating Pokemon, and from here things should be easier. It's a bit annoying because the Dragonair knows Shed Skin, so I put it to sleep, I have to put it to sleep again. But Psychic one hits, there's another Dragonair, we have to put it to sleep twice, and then I knock it out. So Butterfree has made it to the champion. As always, he leads with his Pidgeot. And at this moment, I realized that I had not used a PP restoring item, so that's unfortunate. <laughs> I'll have just enough sleep powders to use one on each one of his Pokemon. I put the Pidgeot to sleep, and then knock it out over two turns. Next is Rhydon. I put it to sleep, and unfortunately after surviving a Dream Eater, it wakes up using Scary Face dropping my speed, but still it's slow, I'm faster, and I knock it out. However, Charizard's next, and I don't outspeed it. As a result, it hits a massive Fire Blast, but Butterfree survives, puts the Lizard to sleep, and starts to heal with Dream Eater. And I actually managed to get three in with the Charizard not waking up, healing me back to green and knocking it out. Next is Alakazam. It moves first, setting up Reflect, I put it to sleep, and then I have to knock it out with Psychic, which is gonna take a while. Also, it wakes up immediately, and as a result, Butterfree goes down. So uh, I was really silly. I should have just used an elixir here. After all, I have enough. Let's take care of that right now, and then I won't have any PP problems in this final fight. I save over it to ensure that I don't make that mistake again. And now let's take the rival on. Let's make this the final fight. Pidgeot's first. I go for Sleep Powder. It goes to sleep. Perfect. That's a good start. Next, I decide to use Psychic. After all, it can lower special defense. In this case, it does. But Pidgeot wakes up and uses Sand Attack. Ah, <sighs> okay. My next Psychic takes it out. I move on to the Rhydon. Sleep Powder puts it to sleep. And this time it doesn't wake up, so I knock it out with two uses of Dream Eater. Okay, but it seems like everything is really going to come down to how things go against this Charizard. Unfortunately, after putting it to sleep, Psychic misses. It does some damage to Butterfree. And on the next turn, I miss with Sleep Powder. As a result, Charizard hits Fire Blast and Butterfree goes down. That is my 20th reset. However, Compound Eyes and Sleep Powder have got me this far. I don't think I need to black out. I can definitely win this fight. Unfortunately here, Pidgeot wakes up, uses Aerial Ace, and does almost half to Butterfree before the Rhydon even comes out. Against it, I go for Sleep Powder, it puts it to sleep. 
Okay, so let's use Dream Eater to recover back the health that I lost on the Pidgeot. With only one, I almost do that. Like, I only have three more hit points to recover. And because Rhydon stays asleep, I recover that back on the next turn. Okay, it is time for the Charizard. I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. Now I'm going to need three hits. I decided to go for Psychic because if it gets the special defense drop, I think I might two hit, but it doesn't. Charizard recovers some health with a Citrus Berry. However, it isn't enough and I knock it out. Butterfree levels up to level 74. Now it's time for the Alakazam. I debated here using Sleep Powder or using Silver Wind, but in the end I decided to put it to sleep just to be a little bit more safe. I go for Silver Wind next, and it takes it down in one hit. No Omni Boost, all right. Executor is next, it's a Grass Psychic type, so Silver Wind is gonna do four times damage, but it just barely doesn't knock it out. And then, uh, yeah, I get flashbacks to Generation 1 because Executor puts Butterfree to sleep. Uh, when Butterfree wakes up, I get my revenge by putting the Executor to sleep, and then I'm going to knock it out over two turns with Silverwind. Well, that is if the uh, champion doesn't keep using four restores on it. He actually uses a total of four here, which fully stalls out my Silverwind PP. I uh, really should have used a PP up on that move instead of Dream Eater. But luckily for me, my last Silverwind does get an Omni Boost, so Psychic is at least dealing decent damage to the Executor, and I take it out over two turns. All that's left is Gyarados. I put it to sleep, and Psychic takes it out over two turns. So, Butterfree has beat Fire Red, so I'm going to leave the clock running right here, which is not typically how I take times at the end of my videos. So here's why I'm doing this. When you speed run these games, you get to see the time when your character is displayed at the very end of the game, and it shows you the game time. So in this case, I'm going to take the real time that is displayed when my character appears. So today, Butterfree clocks in with a time of 2 hours, 7 minutes, and 47 seconds, with 20 resets at level 74. This took 7 hours and 9 minutes of game time. And I have to say, after all of this, I am very surprised. Fire Red and Leaf Green was nowhere near as difficult as Emerald was with a Butterfree. After all, there are no significant double battles like Tate and Liza to really mess me up and make me forget that I can use Giga Drain. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I've improved a lot in the last year. On the day I'm recording this, I am approaching 49,000 subscribers. If we get to 50,000 subscribers before January, which I would really like, please make my holiday season by getting me there. So uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, <laughs> please subscribe. Anyways, if we do reach that goal, I will have to do a mythical Pokemon in Fire Red in January. If not, I will probably do a Legendary to figure out just how fast Pokemon can get through this game when I am bad at the game. So sort of mirroring my approach with Pokemon Emerald that I've taken over the last month. Also, there is one more thing that I should mention in these games, which is the fact that there are re-battles for all of the League members. I am not entirely sure if I want to include these in the videos yet, so please let me know in the comments if you think I should. I will be clocking in after I defeat the League for the first time. I don't really think it's fair to judge Pokemon based on the second round at the League, but I could add it as a bonus portion of the videos if enough people are interested in it. And with that, that ends the daily uploads for me. There is going to be an upload on December 31st, and after that we will be going to weekly uploads for most of 2023. Of course, there will be some special events here and there. Happy holidays, everyone. Also, Merry Christmas. After all, today is Christmas. So I hope starting Fire Red was a good present for all of you. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, I just want to say a truly heartfelt thank you. You are the reason that a lot of this is possible and that we were able to work so much to pull off daily uploads. I really appreciate the support, and I'm sure everyone else does too who views these videos. Also, I just want to say thanks to everyone who watches these videos. Really, you're all incredible. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in my next video.